of all the stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent <laughs> with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. And so where does this come from? How does, how do, how do you get us, how does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names? How does this happen? And it happens because, because there was this particularly fertile, fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300 year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists, they were all there exchanging ideas. All of them. All of them. And it was that period where you had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics. All right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. They ever stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in, in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called? Arabic numerals, okay? They fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on, and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand-year tradition in, the, in Islam. It's traceable to this 300-year period. This 300-year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. And so something happened. And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I get, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali. All right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed, and it has not recovered since. If you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, per that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world, revelation replaced investigation. Okay? So I fast forward to 20, 21st century, and what do you find? You get things like this. Okay? This is in America. All right? So now, what I find interesting is it's the, it's the level of passion that it requires to actually do it. You've got to, like, pay for this, okay? And it means a lot of people are pissed off at the Big Bang. They're pissed off at the Big Bang. So there's that, but there's also, uh, here's a little bit of intelligent design here. Here's one that, that is, wants to accept the science, but then is, like, what's before the Big Bang. We don't quite know yet, so God was there. So, so of course... Intelligent design is basically a god of the gaps. But my favorite way to end this, then, is to just reflect on, uh, I want to do it just a fast tirade on stupid design, and uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, OK? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable. Uh, star formation is completely inefficient. Most places in the universe will kill life instantly, instantly. The people that say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me. <laughs> Just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden, all right? That's the universe. Then Earth, volcanoes, tsunami just killed, uh, you know, I think that number's higher, up 200,000 people, floods, tornadoes. None of this is any sign that there's a benevolent anything out there. And this 90% is, should be 99%, as was earlier noted, that's a, um, of all life that has ever lived is now extinct. Um, <laughs> And look how long it took to make multicellular life. Not from the beginning of the Earth. Life happened quickly, but not multicellular life. 
uh, you needed your cyanobacteria to sort of crank on the oxygen, get the oxygen budget going. Then you could have sort of, uh, that's sort of rocket fuel for multicellular creatures. But that took three and a half billion years. That's hardly an efficient plan with us in mind. Um, and in human beings, this is like the most tragic of them. I don't even include here the expression of free will where people want to kill each other. I'm talking about nature killing us without the help of human beings. Aggressive childhood leukemia, hemophilia, all of this, all of this. And we so much praise about the human eye, but anyone who's seen the full breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum will recognize how blind we are, okay? And part of that blindness means we can't see, we, we can't detect magnetic fields, ionizing radiation, radon. We are like sitting ducks for, for ionizing radiation. Um, we have to eat constantly because we're warm-blooded. Crocodile eat a chicken a month, it's fine, okay? <laughs> so we're always looking for food. And with the birth defects, most are unknown. Look at this. <laughs> Others, we, it's like abuse and infection and stuff that human beings have something to do with. Here's, we have no idea. No idea. And, you know, and birth defects are tragic. They're tragic, particularly if they happen to the family afflicted by it. And you just look at images of these aborted fetuses because of the, and most of these are stillborn. Others are born, you know, born with a heart outside the body. And so this is all simply stupid design. And the problem is if you look for what is intelligent, and yeah, you can find some things that are just really beautiful and really, hey, that's, a, that's a clever, you know, the ball socket of the shoulder. And a lot of things you can point to, but then you stop looking at all the things that confound that revelation. Put that in context and realize, of course, the universe is not here for us, for any uh, uh, singular purpose. My favorite of all is, of course, you eat, breathe, eat, and drink through the same hole in your body, guaranteeing that some percent of, our, of us will choke to death every year, okay? Imagine if you had a separate hole for breathing and eating and talking. That would be just really cool, right? <laughs> it was just, you could drink, breathe, and just talk, and you would never choke, all right? And it's not, it's not a hard request. Dolphins breathe and eat through different holes in their body. And that's a mammal. So I'm not asking, I'm not, you know, this is like Santa Claus could bring this one. Um, and this one, of course, my favorite of all, like, what's this going on between our legs, right? As you've heard, like, it's, we have, and, and you've heard it. It's like an entertainment complex in the middle of a sewage system. No engineer would design that at all. Ever. It's like the wrong juxta juxtaposition of elements. So what I want to put on the table is the fact that I don't want the religious person in the lab telling me that God is responsible for what it is they cannot discover. Because look at the hubris of that. You're in the lab and you say, I don't know how this works. And not only that, no one alive on Earth knows how this works. And not only that, no one who will ever be born will know how this works. That's kind of audacious when you think about it. And then you put it down and go on to the next problem. This problem is a cure for Alzheimer or, or cancer or whatever else. I don't want them in the science classroom. And so the issue is simply about progress and discovery. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim. And it's like one, maybe two. Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes, okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops. Okay? So you to ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. And so what I want to put on the table is why, so that's, that's the end of my talk, but I want to say, I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God, I want to know why 15% don't. And that's really the, what we got to address here. Otherwise, the public is, is secondary to this. Thank you for your attention here.